Hello and welcome to Worship from the West Highlands. We're in Eastertide, so we use a traditional greeting. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Easter is a time when we particularly reflect on the promises we've been given, on the hope we've been given, that Jesus, through the cross and resurrection, has won the victory over sin, death, all that is dark. When we look around at the world and see what's happening, we may sometimes find it difficult to hold on to that hope. But as some words from the beginning of John's Gospel remind us, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So with confidence in our risen Lord, let us join together in the great Easter hymn, the day of resurrection. Let us pray. Loving God, in this Easter season, we are reminded of how difficult it was even for the disciples to fully grasp your presence and power. As we come to you this day in our homes, we come bowed down in humble adoration with no fixed certainties, no fixed faith. Living Jesus, you came to your disciples when they needed you. Come to us now and reassure us. Help us in our moments of doubt to be able to cry out, My Lord and my God, as Thomas did. Help us to be honest in our words as we wrestle with our uncertainties, knowing that you love us for them, not in spite of them. Listening Spirit, ever present in our lives, surrounding us with your presence, Make your presence known to us now. Reassure us that our questions are valid and not something for which to be ashamed. Help us to voice them as Thomas did. Holy Trinity, forgive us if we ever let the doubts take over. Forgive us for harsh words that belie your love. Forgive us the things left undone and assure us of your never-ending love and grace, giving us the peace you offer over and over and over again. Amen. A reading from John 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was one of the twelve. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails are, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from his most holy word. Amen. When we move through Holy Week and the accounts of the first Easter, we probably miss much of the experience of those first disciples. We hear the accounts of Good Friday, of the crucifixion, but know that the resurrection will follow and that Jesus will be seen again by his followers. The disciples we meet in the locked room in today's Gospel reading had heard Mary Magdalene claim that she'd seen Jesus. Peter and John had witnessed the empty tomb and the grave clothes but they still had no understanding of the immensity of what had taken place. We're told that they were afraid, afraid of the Jews. This means the Jewish hierarchy and authorities, those whom Jesus had challenged, those who brought about his execution. The disciples had been active supporters of Jesus, so it's no surprise that they were afraid wondering if the next sounds at their door would be of men coming to arrest them. Would they be executed as well? It's a scene we see repeated today. We hear of or see people who oppose authorities or even just express mild disagreement being dragged away, thrown into prison or worse. Added to the disciples' feelings of fear were the feelings of bereavement. They'd lost a close friend and teacher, someone with whom they'd lived, with whom they'd worked, with whom they'd laughed. But it was not just the loss of a friend. Jesus had taught them that a whole new kingdom was appearing. He taught them to see God as a father, all loving, all merciful. They'd entered Jerusalem with Jesus on Palm Sunday with hope sky high. Now they'd lost all of that, thrown down into despair. Had all that Jesus taught them been wrong? Assuming they escaped Jerusalem in one piece, would they be able to cope with returning to their life before? the rule-bound religion that Judaism had become? They were people in a very dark place. Our reading said that it was evening. 
In the disciples' hearts, it was probably dead of night. And into this deep darkness, Jesus suddenly appears. No knock at the door or creaking of a door opening. Jesus just appears and says, Peace be with you. It's as if near the end of John's Gospel, we're taken right back to the beginning, where in the opening verses we read, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. With Jesus, light floods into that room, and the disciples rejoice. The impossible had happened. Hope had been reborn. And in John's account, they also received the Holy Spirit at this point. Now we come to Thomas. I have a soft spot for him. When I was young, you often heard the expression, a doubting Thomas, used in a disparaging way about a person who didn't believe something. I think that Thomas's doubts were quite reasonable and that I quite probably have reacted in a similar way. For some reason, Thomas was not present when Jesus appeared. He may have been running an errand, getting necessary food, for instance. Or perhaps he just needed to get away from the depressing atmosphere of the room and have some time by himself. We don't know. But when he returns, the other disciples have moved from darkness to light, from despair to joy. Thomas, however, is still in the darkness and despair. Imagine returning to the group and the others saying to you, Wow, you should have been here. You don't know what you've missed. Jesus is alive and came to us. How would you react? It's not fair. Are they winding me up? Is it a cruel joke? Are they drunk? Have they cracked up completely? If it is true, why did Jesus come while I was out? Aren't I good enough? No, it can't be true, it's ridiculous. I find Thomas's actual reaction very human and quite reasonable. I want some proof. It's very easy to criticise Thomas for not believing his companions, but we should remember that they had had the proof which Thomas was requesting. Jesus had showed them the wounds in his hands and side. I think that there is a healthy doubting, doubting that leads to questioning and exploring, that leads to greater understanding. There is also the unhealthy doubting that closes the mind to any possibility other than that which I already think. That doubting is actually a form of certainty. Certainty that something couldn't be true, couldn't have happened, end of story. Thomas doubts, but is willing to be convinced. And Jesus is willing to help him to convince him. A week later, Jesus reappears in the room and gives Thomas the proof he asks for. Thomas is convinced that Jesus has risen and makes one of the strongest, if not the strongest affirmation of faith of any of the disciples. Thomas says, my Lord and my God, Then we come to what is sometimes called the extra beatitude, the extra blessed are. Jesus said to him, 
Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The disciples are to continue Jesus' work. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Many, if not most of the people to whom the disciples will go, will not have seen Jesus in the flesh, but will still come to believe the good news. We don't walk with, see and touch Jesus in the way his first disciples did. We walk with and listen to the risen Jesus. We believe in faith. To quote the letter to the Hebrews, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Our faith, our confidence, may well have grown through our exploration, through our questioning, through our doubting. The writer Dostoevsky likens this process to the refining of metal. Metal is heated in a crucible to a very high temperature so that impurities burn away or come to the surface and can then be skimmed off. Dostoevsky says, my Hosanna was born in a crucible of doubt. So let us explore, let us question, let us not be afraid to air our doubts. Questions and doubts that may multiply when we feel surrounded by darkness. Jesus already knows what's in our hearts and minds. Let us open them to the light of our risen loving Lord that we may learn and find an even firmer footing for our pilgrim journey. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, the world is full of people with questions and we have questions too. And so we bring some of these to you today, looking for answers and yet at the same time knowing that we already have many of them. Why is it children in some parts of the world go to bed hungry? Why is it that people still live in fear and we still wage war against each other? Why is it that some seem to have more than they need whilst others struggle to get by? Why is it that some have privileges and others cannot be heard? Why is it that we have allowed a climate crisis to develop when it was needless and reckless? Why is it that power corrupts? And why is it that our planet seems such an unfair place? Why is it? Lord, we do not expect answers to all of these questions. Perhaps in the honest asking of them, we find the answers within ourselves. Help us to understand better, to serve better, to love better, and in so doing, answer our own questions. So be it. Amen. We consider our offerings. Lord, we bring you only what is yours, that you might use these offerings and the givers for the bringing of light into our world, to the glory of your name. Amen. And we draw all our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Listen to the
the words of the risen Christ Peace be with you Come see his hands and the wound in his side May the risen Jesus, who has won the victory over sin, death and darkness, fill the hearts of all with his heavenly light. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with us, with all who we love, and with all God's children everywhere. Amen. Keep you.
Shine upon you 